Good evening. So it's seven o'clock. We do not have a quorum for any voting or anything. If everyone's okay with it, I think actually let me check. Someone dissented. Oh, we do now. Okay. Well, welcome. This is the February 2022 meeting of the Alcoholic Beverage Control and Public Safety Meeting for ANC 1C. I'm Peter Wood. Uh, we have Commissioners Fiona Clem and our newer member, uh, very recently added <laughs> Commissioner Howard Balki. Uh, and I believe no, our fourth, we have, so we have a, four commissioners on the committee at this point. Our fourth is not currently present, but we'll start off. We have two agenda items today. One is monthly update from the third district of the Metropolitan Police Department. And then also we'll be hearing from uh, Yerevan who has applied for a Class C restaurant license from Abra. And we'll hear a bit about their business and uh, how they plan to use their <laughs> that the potential license uh, as a part of the neighborhood. So without further ado, we have Captain Hong here. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, so I'm going to go over the crime stats and trends for the month of January. And uh, we've had a slight uptick uh, as compared to last year. Uh, we had an increase of three total crimes. Uh, seven of them were violent crimes and I'll go over the violent crimes uh, briefly. We had one assault with a dangerous weapon on the 10th of January um, at about 10.57 a.m. in the 1600 block of Crescent Place Northwest. Um, a theft from auto was occurring and the victim confronted the suspect at which point he turned around, pointed a gun and then fled in a vehicle driven by a second suspect and tools were taken. Um, we had to six robberies um, on the 27th around 9 49 p.m. in the 1800 block of Mentwood Place. We had three suspects assault victim, took uh, her purse and cell phone, then fled in a vehicle. On the 26th around 9 50 p.m. in the 2100 block of Ontario Road, we had two suspects assault the victim, took the cell phone and keys, then fled on foot. On the 25th, around 2.13 a.m. in the 1900 block of Wyoming Avenue, we had two suspects approach, uh, a victim that was uh, sitting in the vehicle, brandished gun, obtained cash, um, attempted to steal the car, but it was a stick shift. Uh, they were unsuccessful. They jumped in another vehicle occupied by two more suspects and fled. Um, on the 24th, 10.25 p.m., in the 1700 block of Columbia Road, we had four suspects approach, uh, one tapped on the window of a gun, uh, with a gun, indicated for the victim to exit uh, their vehicle. And they took the vehicle, uh, last seen driving off. On the 24th at 12.40 p.m. in the 1800 block of Biltmore Street, a uh, victim was approached, uh, approaching his vehicle after making a delivery when a suspect uh, approached from behind, pushed the victim, and drove off in the victim's vehicle. And on the 19th, around 12.40 a.m., in the 1600 block of Columbia Road, we had two suspects approach, uh, obtain the victim's wallet, brandish a knife when the victim reached for his backpack, then fled in their uh, fleeing vehicle. And we've had, uh, crime trend-wise, we've had an uptick uh, throughout the city in uh, robberies involving vehicles where uh, suspects are uh, driving around in a vehicle, uh, committing a robbery in one location. And oftentimes it may lead to a spree uh, in different parts of the city. Um, and we've increased in addition to our robbery task force and other patrol units. Um, we do have traffic vehicles that are focusing on the areas where the robberies have occurred, uh, knowing that a lot of times vehicles are uh, involved in it. We're in increasing the uh, traffic enforcement, not just for traffic safety, but uh, to uh, focus on the um, possible uh, robbery suspects. And I know that uh, we've had several closures uh, with arrests. Um, I know of one specific incident where uh, three of our robberies that occurred uh, in one area on the same evening, uh, done by the same two suspects, they were later apprehended 
uh, in another district, in the fifth district, I believe. And um, in that the suspect uh, vehicle was recovered, uh, some property was recovered. So uh, a lot of this uptick is being done by small groups of repeat offenders. And once uh, we are able to um, get the repeat offenders, uh, the trend seems to stop. So we've had some success. The carjacking task force investigators are actually um, handling a lot of these um, cases because it, it goes spans multiple uh, districts. Thank you so much. So I have a few questions and I'll open up to everyone else. Uh, I think you might've partially answered one, but I'll get to it in a second. Just a couple of other specific areas that I'm just wondering if you have any follow-up on. Uh, I know that one in, in Commissioner Faustini, welcome by the way, <laughs> uh, in your, his SMD, the uh, D-Light Cafe, uh, was a victim of supposed arson. Uh, any update on that situation? Oh yes, um, so we've had an arrest in the arson. Um, we were able to obtain good video footage and um, those arson cases are investigated by the um, fire departments, uh, arson investigators, but our officers have had previous contact and dealings with the uh, suspect in question. And once uh, we disseminated the footage from the video, um, some, I know at least two or three of our officers immediately recognized the individual and provided the information, which was um, forwarded on and uh, the arson was um, closed with an arrest. Uh, thanks for that. And another item, I mean, literally across the street, the plaza adjacent to the old SunTrust building. I know there's been some complaints, and I think we've been on a few different calls together, where business owners and some neighbors have been disturbed by, I think it's particularly Thursday nights, there's been very loud performances occurring. Uh, any update on how that whole you know, development has been addressed? Yeah, so um, our officials and officers um, make contact with the organizer, uh, I believe two Thursdays ago. Um, and uh, when they make contact at that time, uh, they, they indicated that the, the owner of the property, Truist, has indicated uh, and provided documentation saying that they're, they're not authorizing um, that kind of uh, behavior or activities, which the community uh, various members of the community have complained about the noise and possible profanity being um, voiced on a microphone. Um, and when that was shared, uh, the individual was cooperative. Um, they mentioned to the officers that um, due to the noise complaints from the neighbors, maybe he would hold off his activities until the summer. And um, the following Thursday, when we checked, uh, he wasn't there, and so far, I have not heard another complaint about uh, the individual returning or the next complaints. All right, thank you. And one more for me. Well, I guess one and a half. I think I know the answer to the other. <laughs> uh, I've had, at the end of, well, the end, the intersection of 18th and Calorama, uh, I've had some constituents tell me that they've just seen quite a bit of illegal parking, especially at weekend nights. There's a couple of street trees, very small little space, which is not conducive to parking. But I mean, I've, only, I've been waiting to cross the street in that space and literally had cars almost hit me because they tried to park there and I didn't expect a car to go there because it's not <laughs> ready for a car to go. But I mean, is that something that, and I think there's another couple spots, like the main spot is by the parking garage just on the street, but is that something that you've encountered or have any suggestions on what the best approach is when any of us hears of that or sees firsthand illegal parking? Because it really just, can, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on with, on the DOT side of things to potentially redirect how the streets are run, but in the meantime, it still becomes a mess quite easily and it's really dangerous. Do you have just any words of advice for how we should go about that? Oh yeah, sure. Um, so any, I like to share with the public that anytime they see some public safety issue, um, we do request a call to 911 or a text to 50411 um, for the text because uh, they're not gonna get contacted back um, or followed up on. We, we do need very accurate information as, as the specific location to include the quadrant of the city um, so that once that information's uh, given to the dispatcher, they'll know exactly where and what the issue is. Um, 
the the reasons for uh, calling in all those um, incidents is um, because it'll be tracked. Um, they will have their own priority list. Uh, so if there are fights or other more serious crimes going on, they're they're gonna put it on their list, but put it at the bottom. Um, but statistically, it'll show that there is a need in that area and that we have had complaints of uh, parking violations uh, in that intersection. And um, having that kind of statistical information also helps us to um, request other agencies. So if MPD is busy responding to the criminal activity on the weekends or fights or a lot of the different things, um, if uh, we can reach out and work with um, parking enforcement, uh, they may be able to um, assign some attention to that area. And typically I know um, when, before COVID, we used to have uh, a lot of parking enforcement going around uh, 18th Street, Columbia uh, Road. And we've also had um, traffic uh, assistance from, I, I believe it was DPW. Uh, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but since COVID, I think a lot of the um, interagency activity may have ceased or decreased. So that's something I can uh, reach out to because um, I know there are many areas I I've Personally, uh, when I work some other Friday nights um, on the midnight shift, I see a lot of illegal parked cars all along Columbia Road. And I could imagine all the surrounding areas of the hot um, 18th Street uh, could have issues. So if we have a dedicated traffic enforcement team that could address all those issues, um, that would probably be the best thing. So. Yeah, of course, it's not our decision, but I think we agree. <laughs> uh, and we're last, I think the answer no, is no to this question, but Biltmore and Columbia, there's a fatality, Lena Larson, a few months ago, any update on that situation? Yeah, so um, it's, it's still an open case uh, being investigated by the major crash division, uh, which handles all fatal accidents. Uh, what I can say is from, from what I've seen um, so far, it does not seem to be any um, determination of um, criminal act by the driver. Um, no charges have been charged as far as I know. Uh, so at this point with the investigation going on, um, on, unless there's some additional information, I'll have to periodically follow up um, probably on a monthly basis to see if there's been any um, new evidence or revelations, but otherwise it'll remain open. Um, and I, I imagine if, if there is a big development um, or some new information that changes circumstances, there may be a press release uh, or at the very least when I follow up, with, I should get some kind of update. Thank you. Uh, I see we have a hand from the audience just quickly beforehand, any Commissioner, so we have Commissioner Faulkner on the line. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks. Um, I had a question about, um, I heard from some constituents um, that there was an assault um, last week, I think last um, uh, Thursday night on Clydesdale Place. Uh, a woman was assaulted by people who were in a, a sedan and, and hopped out. And I don't think it was a, a no car theft was involved, which I know was a lot of what the assaults you were talking about were. I don't know if you have more information about that. Um, I think that some people were saying that they had heard that this was a pattern of, of folks in um, a particular like silver sedan and assaulting um, people. So I know you, I think, I don't know if you mentioned that that particular case and I know that was February. So you probably were just talking about January but I just wanted to ask about that. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, let me see if um, I can pull this up real quick. I believe, uh, I can confirm in a moment. I believe that may have been a robbery and um, there had been some concern about the location. However, um, in PSA 303, we've had a lot of robberies and it's been um, scattered uh, for the most part. It, it's along uh, Columbia Road, but I believe there's been one or two uh, there have been at least two uh, that were just um, kind of out of the way, a random residential area uh, that 
the suspects just happened to be driving around and they saw an opportunity. Um, but let me see if I could verify that for you. I don't know that Clydesdale was the actual location of the report, but. I think it, it may also have been Ontario Road. Clydesdale's very small. I know the building was on Clydesdale that, that notified people, but. Um... Okay, so we did have carrying the address of the 2800 block of Adams Mill Road. Uh, we did have a robbery where um, a silver sedan pulled up and three suspects jumped out, assaulted and took the victim's purse and keys and then fled in the silver sedan. Um, and that was on Wednesday, uh, this past Wednesday. So that may be related to the information with the silver sedan and the people jumping out on the victim. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And thanks, Commissioner Balaki. Oh, thanks. I just uh, wanted to say it's it's great to be on the committee. I look forward to working with all of you, and wanted to uh, thank uh, Captain Hong in particular for uh, doing this every month. I've been trying to follow this uh, committee for the past few months, mainly to listen to uh, Captain Hong. I think it's very useful and. Uh, Look forward to working with you. Thanks. Thank you. I will second those thoughts and welcome again uh, with Commissioner Falskini, and then we'll get to some audience questions. Hi, Captain Hong. How are you? Good. Good. Um, first off, thank you so much for the uh, very quick and thorough response to my constituent that I forwarded that email to you, you earlier this month. I, I really appreciate that, um, that great response that you had. So thanks a lot. Um, other question was, you said that there was an uptick in crime and perhaps I just missed it because I, I know I was a minute late to the meeting, um, but what were the actual total stats for the month and year on year stats? Yeah, so the total crime for uh, this, um, the month of January this year was 46 total crimes and seven of those were violent crimes, the rest were property. And uh, compared to last year this time, um, last year we have 43 with four being violent crimes. Thank you. Um, and then my last question was, uh, what are your recommendations for folks if they are involved in one of these carjackings? You know, if they are, you know, parked in the neighborhood and waiting and someone comes up and knocks on the window, you know, what are your recommendations? What should we tell our constituents about what they should do in order to stay safe in that sort of situation? Sure. Um, so let's see if I could uh, approach this um, in a prevention aspect. And also just in case it does happen, something that helps us in our investigations. So uh, as far as prevention goes, uh, what makes this difficult is if, if um, the subjects happen to um, steal a vehicle or have a vehicle with some uh, paper tags on it, and they're just driving around uh, looking for opportunity, the opportunity they're looking for is going to be an empty street uh, with a minimal witnesses, uh, a victim where they can clearly see them holding a cell phone or uh, having AirPods in their ears, something that they identify as something they want. Um, and then uh, it happens so quick, they'll pull up, they'll jump out, uh, they'll grab the stuff and jump back in. <clears throat> and what we've seen is uh, the trends show that <clears throat> that um, they, they drive quickly uh, and uh, try to hit some other uh, spots before they are done. So um, because it happens so quickly and so randomly, it's difficult to tell people, um, you know, this is what to watch out for. Uh, but one thing that you could do is uh, 
if you can minimize uh, the visibility of uh, Bluetooth headphones by wearing a hat over, um, not holding a cell phone in your hand, uh, being aware by looking around, uh, trying to use streets that are uh, well lit or where there's a lot of other pedestrian traffic, uh, where you're not the only one in the block. Um, those are always good prevention tips. Uh, one thing that people may want to consider that will greatly aid in the recovery of their vehicle and in our investigations is uh, something that isn't often done. But if you uh, have an iPhone, uh, there's those tracking, um, I forget what they call it. Uh, and then they also have the tile trackers that uh, I believe iPhones and Android phones could use. If you were to invest 20 bucks or however much those cost, um, set it up uh, with your account and stick it somewhere in your vehicle, um, it can help in general times when, let's say you go out for a night and you can't locate where you parked the car, you'll be able to find it easier. And if something were to happen and whether it's stolen from you or you park it somewhere and it's gone and you don't know um, who stole it or if it might've been towed, um, having that little uh, equipment in your vehicle will allow you to uh, narrow down a lot of the information. And what we try to do when we have the robberies or carjackings is we try to track a cell phone or anything trackable. Um, and a lot of times when we do have success, it's because we are able to track uh, something and relay to the units in that area. Uh, that we're tracking it. This is where it is. Sometimes we can get the helicopter involved. And that's uh, very helpful for closing out these investigations. Um, it not only means that the victim will have closure, the victim will uh, likely receive their property faster, um, but it'll also, if it ends up in arrests, it can um, prevent a lot of other uh, victims from being victimized. And it can also close out a lot of crimes for those that have already been victimized by the same individuals. So um, I, I think that's a great thing. If um, in addition to that, if everyone that hasn't taken advantage of the um, camera rebates uh, program from DC government, uh, you can get a rebate for setting up a video camera that aims at the front, um, at the street area. And so anytime that a crime occurs, whether to the citizen themselves or to a neighbor or someone passing through, uh, a lot of times those video footage is what's very helpful for us to identify who the suspect is when we're trying to um, investigate and apprehend them at a later time. That's really helpful and that's really good advice. Thank you so much, Captain Hong. I also just want to uh, flag from the chat uh, Gordon Chafin's uh, question, which is that is striking someone with your car resulting in death not a crime? And I, you know, I, I know that maybe it isn't always, but you know, there is the the legal phrase "res ipsa loquitur," right? Which is like, you know, it 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 clearly was because it happened. <laughs> so is there like, a, you know? isn't having hit someone crossing in a crosswalk, a pedestrian in the crosswalk, doesn't that at least imply that some sort of um, act took place that could be enforced? And um, I think that's, that's why, because there are uh, criminal um, connotations uh, beyond the um, mere uh, traffic accident uh, that it gets uh, investigated by the specialists at a major crash, um, that they consider all those um, factors. Uh, they interview everyone involved, look at all the evidence they can collect. Uh, I believe they do um, data collection from the black box or forensics. There's a lot that goes into it that, um, that uh, those outside of the major crash unit wouldn't uh, have details on, uh, but it's the fact that it's still an open case means that they're still uh, looking into uh, the different evidence. And I know the last time I spoke with them, um, they had mentioned that they were waiting on forensic information. Um, so uh, that's, I can't say clearly that automatically uh, if, if, uh, 
a driver operates their vehicle and uh, strikes a pedestrian and it leads to death, um, that they would automatically pursue that criminal aspect of it. Um, I know there's there's been other uh, cases that I know for sure that there was no criminal um, connotation. Uh, it was a long time ago when I was a young officer, but I remember um, a set of parents with an infant, they, they had the infant uh, re- behind the vehicle, a large SUV, and uh, they each thought that the other parent had the child with them. And the vehicle uh, backed up, um, struck the child, killed the child. And in that situation, it's very unfortunate. It's loss of life. Um, but as far as I know, I, I don't know the details of what the major crash uh, revealed. But as far as I know, um, I think they were just considering that as a, a very unfortunate situation. Um, maybe there should have definitely been more attention given and uh, better things but um, they didn't treat it as uh, uh, criminal charges against the parents, I believe. Okay. And even if criminal charges aren't brought, it is still possible that Nina Larson's family could bring a civil complaint against the family and and sue them for negligence or the driver and sue them for negligence. So there is still that remedy for justice available as well. Yeah. And just kind of quickly, sorry to make you keep waiting, Brian. Uh, kind of going off of the chat questions from Gordon, uh, it, this is mostly out of my ignorance, but the decision, if it were to happen, to raise criminal charges, is that in this particular type of case come from the major crashes, or does that come from a different office, or who, uh, kind of semi-specifically speaking, would be the ones to kind of make that push? Yeah, so uh, the major crash... Uh, investigators, uh, so they're like the detectives uh, that specialize in all this. Um, they'll take all the evidence and all the circumstances, and if they see that uh, there is uh, there are criminal charges that um, should be filed, they will. Um, I can't say uh, as um, first person knowledge, but uh, in most situations, that would lead to a warrant. Uh, which would be reviewed by the prosecutors and the judge. Uh, And once the warrant is drafted to list all the circumstances and the evidence collected, then it would be up to the prosecutors and judge to review it and decide if they are going to go forward with um, charging the uh, individual criminally. I asked my question poorly answered well. Thank you. (laughs) All right. So Brian from the bit, thank you so much for your patience. (laughs) Thanks, thanks, Peter. Um, Kevin Hong, um, I, I was going to ask you this last night at the bid meeting, but you had some uh, some more pressing business to go off and take care of. Um, but so, um, uh, Rise Bakery told me that they got uh, robbed um, Saturday night, maybe early Sunday morning. Uh, someone came in and, and took a cash box or something, and it doesn't seem like it was an extraordinarily large amount of, of money or anything. Um, but he had a concern he shared with me that, uh, and he has some he had some cameras in there. And had some images of them that unfortunately weren't terribly clear. And of course, with COVID, everybody's got masks on, so it's tricky. Um, but uh, but he was he was wondering why the um, detectives didn't uh, look at the cameras at the of the neighbors. And um, and I don't know if the neighbors' cameras were part of the camera rebate program, but I I think it's part of the that program. If you're in there, that uh, you're required to um, to you know give footage to police and assistance with. Uh, investigations, and I was just wondering if there's a if there's a threshold. I mean, obviously, you know, if somebody got murdered or something, and you know, you you'd be checking all the neighbors' cameras. But if it was a relatively small crime, is it is it not does it not meet a threshold to do that? Um, I was just curious about about that. Uh, as far as I know, um, when the detectives investigate, they will take a look at or reach out to the owners of all cameras in the vicinity. Um, it's, it's possible that if the quality of the camera footage in Rice Bakery uh, was very high quality, uh, most likely that's gonna be the best uh, footage to use for any sort of um, flyers uh, to disseminate to the troops. 
um, it, it'll show the person clearly in the location, in the act of whatever they're doing. And that video footage is also what they'll primarily use if they were to uh, release it on YouTube to the public for uh, people to uh, try to identify the individual. Um, a lot of times I know their initial investigation, um, they will note down different um, addresses in the block that uh, has a video, a video camera visible that um, if they aren't able to uh, get in contact with the owner right away, they'll do a follow-up contact. Um, so I can't say uh, for sure uh, what made the um, Rice Bakery owner believe they didn't um, look at the neighbor's cameras, but maybe it's something I, there. Yeah, I mean, he, what he, well, I can read you the text. He said, I was kind of disappointed they didn't try to get any camera footage from the parking garage door, the parking garage door neighbor, because there's camera footage from the back where he exited. Um, so I, I assume that he asked the detective um, and they said no, um, but I, I don't know that for a fact. Um, I'm just uh, speculating. Um, but anyway, I was just I was curious what the uh, what the procedure is there for um, for getting uh, obtaining footage from from cameras. Yeah, um, as far as I know, they usually try to get everything within that vicinity. And uh, in some cases, if um, if that footage is not good, but there's information that the, the suspect ran down the block and made a right turn, or they'll they'll try to see whatever may have uh, some footage. Um, but the, the main goal is to get a clear photo of the suspect. So if they were able to get that from inside the bakery, um, that's probably the primary uh, footage they would use uh, in either case. Yeah, well, that, that makes sense. And if it's middle of the night, that Sure, even uh, um, infrared footage is, is going to be grainy and uh, poor. So, um, okay, thank you. That's all. Thank you so much. Fine. Any last minute hands popping up? I do not think we have any. Thank you. That will conclude this part of tennis agenda. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And thanks for some very good questions. Unfortunate circumstances we're dealing with, but it's good to get some clarity. Thank you. So, let's, yeah, have a good night. Our uh, second and last item in the agenda, we're hearing from uh, Yerevan, who's on 18th Street. We have Stella Gregorian. If we could elevate to her to panelists, please. She'll be presenting a bit of their business and letting us know how they plan to proceed. I think we got it. The floor is yours, Stella, whenever you're ready. Good evening. Um... I hope everybody is doing well and thank you for adding us to your agenda. Um, well, just a little bit about Yerevan Cafe. Uh, we opened uh, in August of 2021 and uh, we are a small um, cafe uh, with uh, Armenian cuisine. And uh, since we have opened, our customers were asking us about the alcohol options. And we're, we recently um, got the paperwork done with Abra and we applied for a restaurant serving and carry out license for alcoholic beverages. And uh, we wanted to ask for your approval letter uh, for, um, uh, for, the, for the license and stipulated license as well. Uh, and uh, I will be able to answer any questions you might have or concerns uh, because uh, the alcohol license is very important for us and uh, for our business, which is at the moment struggling to move forward. Um, and we have emails and messages from the customers constantly urging us to finally get the license and uh, for them to be able to perhaps come more often. Well, I'll lead it off. I mean, I'm glad to hear that you have customers urging you for more reasons for them to give you money. <laughs> so hopefully that's a good one. Uh, just kind of an obvious question, but I think a necessary one. What types of uh, alcoholic beverages are you planning on serving? Uh, what kind of capacity are you expecting in terms of you know, how much you're serving at what hours, things like that? Well, we're 
we will have wine and liquor, um, but I, we don't think that the liquor would be our main um, uh, sales. Uh, we would sell wine and uh, actually beer too. Uh, and it would be Armenian imported wine. It would be something specific that, that uh, our customers or people in the area neighborhood uh, can't find anywhere else. Um, this is the first and only, I believe, uh, Armenian restaurant um, in uh, the DMV area. So um, it's some, somewhat unique and uh, the types of wines, uh, the beer and even liquor that we're going to have is going to be very different and um, people can stop by and experience it. Uh, liquor, I, I don't think it's going to be the most selling product, but it's pretty famous. And uh, I'm sure some customers would come in looking for it, especially with a carry out option. Um, I can see people just hanging out, especially young uh, people just with a glass of wine and having the conversation. I, I don't think it would, it, it's not a bar type of environment. It's a small coffee. And, and we are uh, hours of operation. Hours of operation. Uh, we are uh, we are open ten to eight uh, from Sunday to Thursday, and then Friday and Saturday we're open ten to ten. Um, we are not planning to extend the hours of operation, and uh, I think uh, the mostly after five, five to eight or five to ten would be uh, the hours where people would stop by and have alcoholic beverages. Um, since we are not a bar, uh, we don't think that we would extend our hours uh, later than what we currently have. Perfect. Uh, I will let my other colleagues, if they have any questions, we'll address those first. Anyone have anything? Uh, go, go ahead, Commissioner Faskini. Uh, Stella, I've been to your place. It's lovely. We've gotten coffee. We've picked up some of the little delicacies that you have in the fridge and um, gotten some little chocolates for the kids there. Um, it's right, nice to have it right across from the school, um, just a place to go that's, that's really close. And it's lovely to have you in the neighborhood. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate your business. And we appreciate your support. Thank you very, very much. Of course. Uh, so I guess one other thing that does come up, I, would, I guess just to, I know it gets confusing a lot of times, especially for new owners, uh, the term settlement agreement, has that ever come up to you? Do you know what that is? <laughs> what? Okay. I'm sorry, can you say it again? Uh, sorry. Uh, are you familiar with the settlement agreement process? It used to be called voluntary agreement. It's uh, it's, it varies by neighborhood, but it's a relatively common document that just kind of establishes terms of agreement between the community, the an, and entities like the ANC and others. If you don't, I can send you documentation to read it and we don't have to, it's not something that needs to be discussed directly on this call, but uh, mm -hmm. is that something that you're familiar with or is it something that would be helpful for you to be informed about that? It would be, it would be great if I had a copy um, and to familiarize more. I'll definitely so follow I appreciate up. you yeah. sending Thank you. Yeah, that's something that it's common. It's not something that is uh, directly worked on in meetings, but it's still related to ANSI work. So we'll, the committee together will you know, keep you informed and we'll talk if that's an option. It's a voluntary thing, like I said, but sometimes it kind of mutually helps so that we can uh, you know, help one another to what we want to see in business. And we also want to see it so that your sure. business <laughs> is uh, a, or fitting in well to the neighborhood. Uh, oh, that's Commissioner Balakin, do you have a question? Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, just, just wanted to say very briefly that uh, I'm glad to see what you're doing what you're doing. I've actually been to Yerevan. I was there when I was 18 years old doing study abroad, and it's a tremendously impressive city, and I'm really glad to see a little bit of Armenia here in uh, Adams Morgan. Certainly wish you well. I have not been there yet, but plan to, plan to come by once all this is, is uh, taken care of. And it, I'm new here, but my sense is the next step is going to be sitting down with anybody in the neighborhood who has an interest in this and doing a brief settlement agreement like Peter just mentioned. And, you know, we're talking about adults consuming adult beverages and hopefully behaving like adults. So, I mean, we're not going to have a bunch of, you know, teenagers standing around on the sidewalk outside your place. It's, it's very, a very, very different vibe. So uh, this strikes me as something that should be pretty straightforward. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Looking forward to seeing you at Yerevan. <laughs> I agree. And like I said, I'll send information. I'll send you some examples of what similar agreements look like. Can't expect it to be too complicated, but I guess it's not entirely in our hands. Other organizations also can potentially be involved in that too. So yeah, we'll talk to make sure that that process is clear for everyone. Any other questions from commissioners or the community? If not, I will move to consider the liquor license application at our next ANC1C meeting, which would be March 2nd. Wow, time is flying. <laughs> Can I get a second? Thank you. Thank all, you very all, much. All in favor? Second. Uh, all in favor? Please say aye. 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 All opposed? Abstentions? And it looks like the motion passes for nothing. Thank you so much, Stella, for coming with us. We'll continue to be in Thank contact. You very Hopefully, much. it'll be process love having in the neighborhood <laughs> and <laughs> Thank with you that so much. that concludes our meeting for the month